One cool overcast night in February on a desolate Libyan beach, Aliu Kande climbed into an inflatable Zodiac raft with more than a hundred other migrants, including a half dozen women and several babies. Their destination was Italy's nearest point, the island of Lampedusa, a 26 hour voyage if they made good time. A trafficker had told the migrants that the ocean would get calmer the further they moved from shore. This was untrue. As the waves grew, several queasy passengers began weeping, but Conde knew they were nearing international waters. Hope was within his grasp. Conde grew up in a small village in Guinea-Bissau, where he farmed cassava and yams and cashew nuts with his father. But lately his land barely produced enough food for his family. Droughts lasted twice as long as when his father tilled the land. Conde spoke of failing in the eyes of God, failing to give his wife and children what they needed. His dream was to make it to Spain and find work in a slaughterhouse. Once he earned enough money, he planned to come back for his family. When he left home, he carried two pairs of pants, a t-shirt, a leather diary, a Koran, 600 euros, and a cell phone. During the first hours of the journey, some migrants sang and talked, others slept or stared silently into the dark. Conde sat near the edge of the Zodiac with his leg dangling in the water. The boat was packed so tightly, no one could stretch their legs, and as patience wore, tensions flared. A fight broke out. Then someone pulled a knife and threatened to slash the raft and sink them all until a crowd wrestled him down. The noxious engine fumes and the swelling waves made the migrants seasick, and the pooling water in the base of the boat turned into a wretched soup of vomit, leaked gasoline, urine, and feces. The migrants had been warned to avoid going to the bathroom over the side of the boat, too easy to fall into the ocean. It was a long night at sea. Finally, the migrants decided they were far enough from Libya to call for help on the satellite phone their trafficker gave them. An operator at a humanitarian NGO told them there was a merchant vessel not far away. Everyone on the Zodiac celebrated. In years past, a humanitarian vessel, like a Doctors Without Borders ship, would probably have rescued Conde and his fellow travelers by now and taken them to safety in Europe. But the EU has worked hard to put a stop to that. To prevent migrants from washing up on its shores, Europe has allied with Libya, a broken lawless country, to capture them before they make it across the Mediterranean. Europe has spent hundreds of millions of dollars since 2015 to rebuild and retrain the Libyan Coast Guard to hunt for migrants far from Libyan shores. They've also funded the construction and operation of brutal migrant prisons. Conde and the other migrants notice an airplane overhead. Flight tracking data shows it was a surveillance aircraft leased by EU border authorities who pass intelligence to Libya. As darkness fell, a ship appeared on the horizon. One of the migrants yelled, Shit, it's Libyan. Many of them began to sob. They'd been at sea for about 20 hours. They'd nearly made it. The Libyans rammed their rubber raft three times, as if they meant to sink it. Finally, they ordered the migrants to climb aboard. One officer hit them with the butt of his rifle. Another used a rope to whip them as he ordered them where to sit. Back on shore, Conde and the other migrants were sent to Libya's biggest and most notorious detention center. Al Mabani sits off one of the busiest highways in Libya's capital city, Tripoli. It's made up of three renovated warehouses with eight prison cells. Conde was placed in cell number four. It was suffocating and hot, holding more than 300 men from a dozen or more countries. Fluorescent ceiling lights were left on day and night. A small grill in the main door was the only source of natural light. Thin foam sleeping mats infested with lice 
Scabies and fleas covered every inch of the concrete floor, though there still weren't enough of them. Conde and the other captured migrants took turns sleeping on the mats, one person during the day, another at night. Facilities like Mabani are typically run by one or another of Libya's powerful militias. International aid agencies have issued one report after another documenting abuses. Everything from stealing to torturing, ransoming, even killing detainees. Conde learned Mabani's grim routines. Three times a day, he and the other man in cell number four were fed in the courtyard, divided into groups of five, and left to fight over a single bowl of food. Marched out in single file, they were not to look up, not to steal a peek at the sky or open their mouths to the fresh air. Those who did were beaten. After two bleak months, Conde's resolve cratered. He only wanted to go home. If his children saw him as a failure for not making it to Europe, so be it. At least he'd be alive and free. From a contraband cell phone, he left a voice message for his brothers. <laughs> For the past decade, I've been crisscrossing the globe, focusing on stories of human rights and environmental abuses at sea. I traveled to Libya to investigate the Coast Guard, but also what happened to people like Conde when they make it back to shore and the EU's role in all of it. The Libyan government said I could visit Al Mabani, but after a week in Tripoli, it became clear that wasn't going to happen. Late one afternoon, hoping to get a peek inside, I found a hidden alley a half mile from the detention center, launched a small drone, and flew it over Al Mabani's courtyard at lunchtime. I was back in my hotel room in Tripoli, on the phone with my wife in D.C. There was a knock on the door. When I opened it, a dozen armed men burst in. I stepped back and felt a gun's cold muzzle against my forehead. Someone yelled, get on the floor. I laid face down. Then a man put a hood over my head. I could hear more men coming into the room. The first kick broke two of my ribs. The next one landed in my face. Another kick to my kidney left me with blood in my urine for weeks. Finally, the beating stopped. Someone new entered the room. He put one foot full weight on my hooded head and talked to the others in Arabic. I thought he was going to crush my skull. When the man was done speaking, the others picked me up and dragged me barefoot and hooded through the hotel lobby. They put me in the back seat of a car. They took our whole research team, an editor, photographer, and a filmmaker. Interrogators seated us in chairs in different rooms, kept us blindfolded. After a couple hours, the guards removed our belts, wedding bands, and watches, and took us to our prison cells. Under Libyan law, authorities can detain foreigners indefinitely. Every day, guards visited our cells and ordered us, one by one, to follow them to a room, where they questioned us for hours. We know you work for the CIA, the men kept telling me. Here in Libya, spying is punished by death. They put a gun on the table in front of me. When my wife had heard the commotion in my hotel room, she called the U.S. State Department. They figured out who was holding us and pressed for our release. We were taken from ourselves to record a proof of life video. Our jailers told us to wash the blood and dirt off our faces and to sit on a couch in front of a table with sodas and pastries. They told us to smile, talk, look normal. They ordered us to sign confession documents written in Arabic. After six days, we were told we were going home. We were lucky. Back at Mabani, Conde was awoken by noise coming from the front of cell number four. 
A group of Sudanese detainees was trying to pry open the door and escape. Conde woke up a friend from Ivory Coast who confronted the Sudanese. He said they'd tried to break out several times already, that it was impossible, and that they'd all be beaten. The cell split into two camps, those in favor of escape and those who thought it was doomed and dangerous. Finally, Conde and his friend alerted the guards. The Sudanese felt betrayed, and they turned on their cellmates. For three and a half hours, the migrants brawled. The guards laughed and cheered and filmed the mayhem with their cell phones. Then, near dawn, they returned with weapons, and without warning, fired dozens of rounds through the window. Conde was shot in the neck and killed. A line had been crossed. Now there was a body to deal with. The boss arrived, screaming. You can do anything you want to them. You just can't kill them. An ambulance carried the injured away, but the captive migrants barricaded the door to their cell and said they would only turn over Conde's body if they were all freed. After hours of negotiation, finally the door of cell number four opened. Early morning drivers on the highway next to Almabani slowed to gawk at the scene as 300 migrants scattered from the compound's entrance and melted into the streets of Tripoli. Despite the hell that Libya has become, funded by the EU, the migrants keep coming, pushed by war and increasingly climate change. The waves of desperate people will only grow. Many of them, somehow, will find a way across Libya and onto the water. Despite the EU's hope to stop them there, the boats keep coming. Some of them make it. <laughs>